Well, welcome back to Mr. Obsolete's Vintage Home City. Today we're going to talk about the small gasoline engine and how it's changed people's lives for over the last 140 years. This engine here is what gas engines looked like from about 1880 until the late 30s. And there's a few companies like Fairbanks Morse that made these clear through 1952. But anyway, the engine is uh, what's called a hit and miss engine and what that means is that it only fires under a load when necessary has a mechanism with the governor that'll hold the exhaust valve down it'll coast when there's no load on it when it needs to fire it'll drop off and pick up a fresh charge of gas and air and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the engines over the years and the development so this will be a kind of a brief because what we'll do when the weather's better in the spring and summer, we'll actually get these out, run them, and do a thorough explanation on them and all the features that they had over the years. So this engine is just about as small as they made. They're about a three-quarter horsepower. And all the mechanism is all out in the open here. See the connecting rod is here main bearings are here, you get your flywheels. You'll notice the flywheels are fairly heavy as to continue it through momentum there. And then you can see when it has compression, it'll kick back. There's a governor down in here, which you won't be able to see, but like I say, when we come back and do a full overview on these engines over time, we'll go into detailed explanation of how they work. Another feature that's kind of interesting on this one, the intake valve, which lets the air and the fuel mixture in, is what they call an automatic valve. And so just the suction of the piston going down the bore pulls it open. Later engines, they use a camshaft to operate both the intake and exhaust valves. This is what's called a drip feed oiler. And you lift this lever up and it'll drop oil that drips down on the piston. And that's what lubricates the piston and the cylinder bore. And on the crankcase, there is no crankcase, but there's grease cups here and you squeeze these down and stuff will put grease into the bearing surfaces. And you see there's a little bitty one here on the connecting rod too. So that's how these were lubricated. And every so often you'd have to shut it down and uh, twist those down to grease them. The ignition system on this has a spark plug and those didn't really come in until 1919. Before that, they had a uh, low tension ignition system which used a coil and a battery and a set of contact points like in a distributor but they were mounted inside the cylinder and so they would open and close and cause a spark in there and light off the gas air mixture. So anyway, we'll move on to the next one. Okay, this engine is an early 30's McCormick Deering one and a half horsepower engine. It's a lot more modern. It has just a single flywheel. The pulley over here runs off the camshaft and the reason for that, the early engines like we previously showed only run from 3 to 600 RPM. This one will run up to a thousand so to keep your belt speed down the camshaft turns at half speed to the crank and so it'll be about 500 RPM. This engine you'll see has mechanically operated valves on both sides gas tanks down in the bottom and exhaust is right here but much more modern these were sold up until about 1942 it has a magneto for the ignition which is a big upgrade okay well we'll move on to the next one well here's the next evolution in the small gas engine this is similar to what we have today it's a 1934 Cushman Cushman Motor Works was a company that had been in business since 1913 until about 1985 when they were bought out and phased out, but they made a lot of different things we'll talk about. But this is an air-cooled four-cycle engine. The engines that we've shown you so far are all four-cycle or two-cycle engines, which we'll talk about. But This one was an industrial engine. Here's a has a hand starter on it to spin it over. And carburetors right here and exhaust and the output shaft to run whatever these were used a lot on portable cement mixers 
1936, they started making motor scooters. So if you, any of you remember the Cushman motor scooters, this is the engine that started it all. And they used these clips until 1965 when they went out of business selling scooters. And, uh, it's all self-contained. The oil goes down in gas here and oil in the sump here. And on the McCormick I just showed you, I forgot to mention, but the crankcase is enclosed to keep out debris and stuff where the early engine was out in the open so all the elements could get to them and damage them. So anyway, this is a one horsepower engine. It's governed at a certain ready, running steady speed. And the other way that they made them was with a throttle governor where if the load changes, then it'll open up the plate in the carburetor and let more and air fuel in to maintain the speed and as a governor to control it. But these were really superb engines. The main bearings in them were Timken roller bearings. The connecting rod on them has insert bearings, has an oil pump built into it, has stellite face valves. They were made to last for a really, really long time. Not like the cheap stuff we have today, you just throw it away. So we'll be back with some a little bit more modern ones here shortly. Well, here's a later version of the small air-cooled engine. This engine is a Clinton engine. It was made in the U.S. They were made from 1946 until 1982. They were the second largest selling gas engine, small engines like this in the world, next to Briggs & Stratton. This one is pretty unusual. It has a kickstarter on it. So push it through. And this was only used for a short time. And most of these were used on Hiawatha Doodlebug motor scooters from 1948. And so this is a nice find here to have one with that on it. They uh, just started to experiment with aluminum a little bit. All the engines so far have cast iron crankcase and cylinder. This one has an aluminum head on it to dissipate the heat a little bit better. And it took them quite a while experimenting with aluminum before they came out with aluminum engines. But uh, anyway, just the normal setup. The carburetor's right here, exhaust here. Of course the fuel tank, kickstarter, the shroud that blows the air across the cylinder to cool it. So this will be the next generation here. This one has a recoil starter, which you're all familiar with. Carburetor stuff. Interesting thing with Clinton is that virtually every part on the engine was built by them, except for the spark plug and sometimes the magneto parts. But they built their own carburetor. All the internal parts were all made in-house. And there again, aluminum cylinder head, but cast iron block. If you look in here real close, it says heavy duty. So the cast iron engines were considered the heavy duty engines for hard work. And then when they came out with the aluminum engines, they were for light and medium duty. Here's a mid 60s Clinton all aluminum engine. This particular one was used on a mini bike. Gas tanks built in, so you've got a gas gauge in it. Coil starter. Your air cleaner and a Clinton carburetor. Even used their own little exhaust mufflers that were unique to Clinton's. Kind of hard to find them today, but they're a lot thicker than most of the ones on the Briggs's and stuff. Still got all the decals on it. So this one's going in a motor scooter before too long. So we'll be back and talk about two cycle engines. All the engines so far have been four cycle engines. And although two cycle engines were made after the turn of the century, they weren't very successful and just didn't work very good because of the poor materials and poor designs. But anyway, we'll be right back. Well, we're going to talk about two cycle engines now. The difference between a two and a four cycle is that a two cycle engine has one power output for every single revolution of the crank, and a four cycle, every two revolutions of the crank. Now, two cycle engines were not real popular prior to World War II, except for two things. Well, the two most successful 
two-stroke engines prior to World War II or washing machine engines like this one. This is a Maytag twin, two-cylinder. And they had a metal framework here instead of these wood beams that would fit down on the bottom of a washing machine and a V-belt would run up to the mechanism on it. So you could either use an electric motor or this, depending on where you lived. The other one was outboard motors. Uh, those, those were almost exclusively two strokes from the beginning. And I'll show you one here in just a second. Okay, this is a 1939 Johnson 1.1 horsepower. It's a model MS39. It's unusual that it has U-shaped brass tank. It has a spark plug cover on it and stuff. It's a deluxe model here. But, um, but again, the only two real big users of two strokes prior to World War II were washing machines and outboard motors. And all the technology and the stuff that was in these prior to World War II carried over after the war and stuff. And we'll be back with some more stuff on that in just a minute. Okay, well, after World War II, there was a big pent-up demand for all kinds of power equipment, new rage. The largest selling was the Power Products Company of Grafton, Wisconsin. They're very simple and inexpensive. Just a cheap stamp tin fan. Cylinders right out in the open. The kill switch is just a ground. You push that against the spark plug. And always wear a glove or you'll get a shock. And they were used on everything. Uh, one of the more common uses was Brand X chainsaws. There were a lot of different companies that used this same basic layout. Different companies that make a little change on the chassis and stuff, but they always use the same basic motor. And you know, the tanks are right up on the top here and the carbs down here on the crankcase. This is actually a 1966 Mono. They were one of the larger sellers of the Brand X saws. And they also made some fairly modern ones and were in business for quite a while, but this thing, when it was being sold new in 66, was an antique. But you can see the cylinders, the same exact design. It's got holes in the top here for the shroud to bolt on if it were on a different machine. We've got a parts book on the Power Products engines, and. They made over 52 different crankshafts for all the different things you could buy them on. And then another thing. They're cheapo rotary lawnmowers. This is a Sears Craftsman, about a 1955 model. The thing that's interesting about this the deck is the same as an early Lawn Boy, which Sears also sold in big volume. They put the Brand X motor on it so they could cut the costs. And so you could buy a cheaper mower or something like this. It was about 39 bucks. But, you know, there again, the stamp 10. It's got the screw holes in there for a shroud if it had one. And gas tank's mounted on the back, carburetor in the back. And the engine runs at one speed. They don't have any throttle control on them. just runs at a governed speed. So... The next motor we're going to talk about are Clinton's, so we'll be back in a minute. Well, Clinton was the second largest selling builder of small two-stroke engines. This is what they call a Panther model. They made them in different horsepowers, had three different bores on them for different applications. But um, compared to the power products, almost a clone. It's better because they had a recoil starter and stuff and has more finning on the motor, more effective cooling. Has a big low, low tone quiet muffler on it. And the shaft here is tapered so it ran some kind of a pump or air compressor, something unusual. But that's that. Here's one of their other big sellers for Clinton chainsaws. Same exact power head, just tilted at a different angle. And a simple cast frame. Straight out exhaust. No safety features, too early for that. One weird feature this has is these saw dogs move. And I have no idea why. Nobody's been able to tell me. But So this engine, like the other one, is a universal engine. can be made to be used in anything. So we'll be right back with one other item. Well, this is another thing that they used the same power head in it. But it was an outboard motor this time. 
I actually made virtually everything. The lower unit, everything was made by Clinton. In later years, they sold the design and stuff to a company called Esca, and they were a big supplier of Brand X, low, low end outboard motors to Sears and a bunch of others. Uh, these are good running little engines, they're really noisy, but uh, it's a, you know, a lot cheaper than an Evan or Johnson or whatever. Anyway, this uh, stand here actually is an original Clinton stand I was lucky to find. Need to restore it, of course, but anyway, I'll be back with one more. Well, the number three supplier of small two stroke universal engines was West Bend, West Bend Aluminum Company. And uh, they made them in a lot of different horsepowers and a lot of configurations. Used to see them a lot running sludge pumps and sewage pumps, jackhammers, all kinds of power equipment. They were really popular. And uh, go karts were another thing they used them on. But this is a, kind of a unique feature here. This is a Titan Chainsaw Model 30 that was made in Seattle. And it's got a lot of weird features. It's pretty heavy. Everything's cast aluminum on it and stuff. And this air filter that they have here is a special treated paper it's called a Skinner filter. And it's got your Tillerson pumper carb on it and stuff. But you could run this all upside down and sideways. And the exhaust system here is just a straight pipe. These old saws are pretty loud. They don't run real fast, usually in the four to 6,000 RPM range, but definitely want to wear ear protection and get real irritating after a while. And then the other thing they sold quite a few of other than power equipment was outboard motors. This one was a private label Elgin it was sold to Sears and if it were an actual West Bend it would be called a shrimp. It was 3.6 horsepower, air-cooled of course and uh, just real simple inexpensive outboard motors. They gave really good service. They were just noisy. You know all your controls are right out front here. And then the last one, I don't really have anything to show you much on that, was Home Light. They were a big supplier of pumps and generators and other stuff too. And the thing is, if you lay these engines out on a bench, they're almost identical. The way the ports are, the configuration where the carb goes on the crank and everything, it's just, they're clones. But anyway, that's what put us to where we are today. Everything's got power, lawnmowers, everything in the world. Thanks to the gas engine, our lives are better. Remember, vintage is better. We'll see you on the next video.